co-founder and CEO of Golden Pie, India's leading online platform for all your fixed income investments. So today is the 13th episode from our Industry Speak series, and it's very special. For the regular viewers, uh, you know that we invite the industry veterans, the promoters, and the CXOs of financial institutions and get into deep discussions with them to understand about their company and uh, and you know know more if there are investment opportunities but today we won't be having a discussion about a financial company but on a very very special topic a topic which is of great interest and importance to the entire nation as of this point it's the interim budget and who can be a better entity to share perspective and insights on this particular topic than the largest and the most respected credit rating and research company, Crisin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my sheer pleasure to invite to our discussion today, Mr. Piyush Gupta, who is the director at Crisin. Just to share a little background about Piyush. So, he manages the investment research practice, which caters to mutual funds, um, insurance PMS, alternate investment funds, and uh, retirement and pension funds. Piyush has been associated with Crystal for over 19 years and has contributed significantly to building up uh, credit systems, frameworks, which are used by multiple capital market entities like banks, uh, provident funds, AIFs, etc. A very warm welcome to you, Piyush, uh, for our discussion today. Uh, thank you, Abhijit. Um, cool. So um, I think today we are going to have a very specific discussion focused towards the overall budget that was shared by our Honorable Finance Minister, Mrs. Nirmala Sitaraman, in the morning. And we will understand what is the impact of this budget on the investors' investments and portfolio. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, well, I'll, I'll just take a pause. For our viewers, we will be having a very deep and engaging discussion now with Piyush. Um, during this discussion itself, Please feel free to put in your questions. Uh, we will have our, you know, um, this this entire discussion for around forty five minutes. After which, uh, the rest of the fifteen minutes we will use to answer the queries. All right. So, you uh, here's the thing, right? Uh, today we had the interim budget, and then there is the the general budget, right, or the regular budget. Uh, for you know, for a lot of viewers. Uh, I think the question would be, what is the difference between these two budgets? Let's start from there today. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Abhijit, uh, full year budget, of course, uh, maps out the country's economic goals for the fiscal year. Uh, we being in the election year, the budget that was presented today uh, was the interim budget. Uh, this is a budget that typically provides one, the financial information, uh, of the economy or for a temporal period. It also allows uh, the government to uh, plan and for the government expenditure for this limited period till the time the elections, uh, the new government gets, comes, uh, gets appointed. Uh, other than that, it, it kind of ensures continuity uh, in governance. Having said that, uh, the, the interim budget also gives direction and projections of uh, government towards countries' economic growth, inflation expectation, and financial borrowing numbers. And each of these factors have a bearing on capital market and thereby has an impact on investors, was especially the ones who are investing uh, in capital market through different routes. Got it, got it. Now, uh, you know, uh, continuing on this specific topic of this... Uh, macroeconomic moves right um, and the government's um, declarations in this interim budget uh, what are your views of this budget how is it going to shape 
their capital market and specifically you know uh, the debt market uh, of the country right so uh, one of the key takeaways from today's budget was the fiscal consolidation uh, the numbers that were put out uh, today as far as the fiscal deficit was concerned uh, for the next financial year was is 5.1% which is lower than the 5.8 percent which was uh, which is expected for the current financial year in fact the uh, the budgeted number for previous financial year uh, for the current financial year was 5.9 percent uh, when we look at these numbers in the absolute terms uh, the the fiscal deficit will be uh, 18 16.85 lakh crores compared to 17.35 lakh crore uh, for the current fiscal year Further, uh, this will also bring down the gross market borrowing for the uh, from the government and, uh, for the next financial year. Uh, the, the gross borrowing for the next financial year is expected to be about 14.13 lakh crore compared to 15.4 lakh crore, which is for the current fiscal year. This also means that the net borrowing uh, is going to be lower compared to the, uh, the current fiscal year. Uh, this lower uh, borrowing uh, will have a downward uh, pressure or a, a, a easing pressure as far as the yields are concerned. In fact, as we speak today, today the the uh, the ten-year GSEC uh, has eased by six to seven basis point compared to the uh, yesterday's closing number. Uh, we also see uh, lower uh, inflation for the next fiscal year. Uh, we expect the inflation to average around 4.5% compared to 5.5% in the current financial year. Uh, in addition to that, lower crude oil prices can also uh, be additional factor which will have a downward impact as far as the yields are concerned. Uh, so net-net uh, from the debt market uh, investor perspective, the, the higher yields that we have experienced in the last couple of years, uh, there at least we see uh, some bit of uh, downward movement as we move into the next financial year. Uh, Abhijit, you are on mute, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, in continuation to uh, the point that you mentioned, right, that the downward movement of the of the yield curve, right, um, two things. One, uh, how do you see that impacting the corporate bond market per se, right? I mean, from the perspective that you mentioned, government has mentioned that uh, the borrowing via the issuance of fresh G6, the dated securities is going to be around 14.13 uh, lakh crores, right? Which is uh, lower than uh, around a lakh crores from the previous year, which was 15.7-ish yeah. lakh crores, right? Now with lower borrowings, uh, how do you see that impacting the issuance of the corporate bonds or, you know, the debentures in the market by the private players? Yeah, so that definitely has a positive impact as far as the issuance are concerned. One can expect higher uh, issuances compared to uh, uh, last couple of years. In fact, the issuances uh, in the corporate bond market has been little subdued compared to maybe uh, when we look at numbers prior to 2020 or before COVID. So that is something, uh, it does have a positive impact. Having said that, this is not just this is not just one factor which has a uh, influence on the uh, borrowing. There are multiple other factors which will play out in terms of the borrowing that the corporates will do, uh, uh, which will eventually have an impact on the issuances that come about in the debt market. And uh, you know, on the staying on the same topic, uh, we know that uh, certain of the government securities are due for inclusion into the JP Morgan, you know, uh, you know, global bond index. Uh, and this is slated for June 2024, right? Now, uh, isn't that a great opportunity for, you know, for the government to issue more GSEC and allow the investment of FPI funds over here through the, you know, the far route? Or uh, like, how does that play around over here? How do you foresee this equation playing around of our GSEC's? getting included into the global bond indexes indices 
and you know portfolio money coming in into the country uh, while at the same time government has issued that it will have lower borrowing so lower issuance of these securities how do you see this equation panning out so in fact i would say uh, inclusion of uh, the uh, indian government securities in the global indices is definitely a positive from the perspective of deepening of indian bond market it one diversifies the investor base uh, also uh, it means that there is going there is a inflow that is going to come in into uh, indian debt market through this route uh, uh, in addition to the factor that we discussed earlier this will also kind of contribute in easing of the yields given that the flows will come in from the uh, global market having said that if we were to look at the the total amount uh, outstanding which is expected to get included is about 1.65 lakh crore uh, when you compare this with the expected borrowing of 14 lakh crore it is still a small share compared to the overall bond issuances that we expect in the next fiscal year uh, this at a larger level is positive uh, from the debt market perspective but you can have interim volatility uh, whenever there is a rebalancing that happens in these indices the inclusion of uh, indian government securities in other bond indices is also expected that will and also the, bring in some bit of is. volatility yeah got it got it uh, so um you know uh, just to summarize what you mentioned that um, one uh, this is a great news definitely for our gsex getting included into the global bond index and we will see more bond indices into which you know we should be getting included so fpi money will come in but definitely that will have a downward pressure on the yield curve that that would eventually happen right and that would also probably have a ripple effect on the corporate bond yield curves as well yeah just to add one point here uh... Uh, uh, last year when this was announced, for a short period of time, interest rate did go down. Uh, there was a easing that we uh, saw uh, after the announcement of inclusion of government securities in, the, in these indices. Uh, but it's also important to note that after a while, the other factors came in and we, we saw uh, interest rates or yields going back to their earlier levels. So this is again one of the factors there will be other factors which will be at play, which will have an influence in in terms of the uh, the impact on the overall yield that we see in the Indian market. Right, right. Now, um, you know, continuing on the topic of uh, the corporate bonds per se, right? I mean, there were some very special bonds uh, which got a lot of highlight and issuance in the last fiscal year, uh, namely the municipal bonds, the uh, you know the, the green bonds, and then of course the sovereign gold bond tranches that that came in four times in the uh, last fiscal year, right? Uh, now, uh, it would be of interest to know. How do you foresee this trend going ahead in this fiscal year and with the volumes increase significantly? And, you know, what are the key things that investors should look out in this particular emerging space? Right, right. So uh, principal bonds, uh, in fact, have been there in the Indian market for a very long period of time. Uh, yes, I believe the the first municipal bond was issued by bangalore municipality that's you know that's what was recorded in rbi just a trivia yeah 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 so it's a it's a it's been there for a very long period of time yeah. uh, unfortunately it is a segment which has not grown uh, significantly uh, just to draw a parallel if you look at uh, developed market like us uh, munis have a fairly uh, material share in the overall uh, bonds, uh, bond market, which is there in the US. Uh, but that's not the case in India. Uh, we do, uh, this is an important uh, segment. However, this is a segment which continues to remain small uh, from the overall size of the Indian debt market. There are a few challenges, I would say, with respect to uh, principal bonds. Uh, see, from an investor perspective, when an investor wants to make an investment decision, they look for information, adequate information, basis which they can make an informed decision, which possibly is at times is a bit of challenge when it comes to municipal uh, bonds which are issued. Uh, there are also challenges with respect to the total issuances that have come in the market. 
generally these uh, ticket sizes uh, tend to be smaller. From investor perspective, when the, if the size is not adequate, uh, they don't tend to have a lot of interest given the time and effort that will go into analyzing and then making a decision. So that's uh, there are few factors which have meant that the municipal bonds per se uh, continue to remain a smaller uh, portion of the overall debt market pie. Uh, green bonds is something that we saw the first issuance happening last year uh, for, um, by the government of India. Now, these are newer age uh, uh, securities. Uh, if you look at globally, it is about $2.5 trillion uh, worth of total issuances that are there. Uh, having said that, emerging market is still 2% 2 per, 2 of the total pie. So to that extent, it's still a small portion as far as the uh, developing economies are concerned. And that is true for India also, where we had the issuance coming only in the last one year. Uh, if you look at green bonds, generally uh, long-term investors like retirement funds and insurance companies, they tend to participate in these bonds. And uh, there, there is a specific mandate that is there within their overall investment pattern, which allows them to participate and invest into these bonds. In India, if you see uh, that is that we 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 are yet to see that playing out. Having said that, uh, the the yields that are going to be offered by these bonds is going to be critical from a domestic investor perspective. Uh, and while this is a segment which is expected to grow, but we have to see how it, different factors play out. Sovereign gold bond funds, of course, is a unique product. I would say. Uh, it's a product which offers interest or a regular income in the form of interest that is available, but it also gives exposure to an asset class like gold, which is a natural diversifier. It gives diversification to the investor. Any investor who wants to diversify their portfolio across asset classes, uh, gold is a gold diversifier when it comes to when you compare it with equity or for that matter, debt. Uh, and that has also meant that the, the 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 subscription in these bonds have seen a continuous increase over the last five years. For example, I think in 2016, the total subscription was about 1300 crores, while uh, in the last couple of years, the subscription has been about 16,000 crore and 12,000 crore. So to that extent, there is an interest, investor interest, which is there in these bonds. And this is also, to some extent, uh, the Indian investor who have a liking for gold, which is uh, generally a large part of their investor uh, portfolio, uh, this becomes a good option for investors to participate. It also is a, has other benefits in terms of this being a, a non-physical form of investment. So some of the challenges which are associated with physical gold right. investing, right. those are overcome with these uh, bonds. So if we may double click, you know, on each of these three asset classes, uh, the money bonds or the municipality, municipal bonds, uh, and then the green bonds and then the sovereign gold bonds one by one. So, uh, you know, on the municipal bonds, I think the last tranche that came was in the form of an NCD IPO sometime back in the municipality that issued the, you know, in the municipal bonds, right? Uh, and uh, definitely there was a portion earmarked for retail and it got subscribed, right? Seemed like a fair amount of response from investors. Uh, the question over here is, you know, um, these are great sources of funding for the municipalities to develop their entire infrastructure, right? And US has been able to use it very uh, successfully. As you mentioned, it's, it's a multi-trillion dollar market for the money bonds over there, right? And has great amount of depth and liquidity. Uh, the question is, you know, what can our government do to facilitate the widening and deepening of this specific, you know, bond type in, in, in the Indian capital market? I think uh, uh, some of the challenges that I spoke about earlier, they have to be overcome. So uh, information asymmetry or transparency uh, is a critical factor. Any investor who is looking at investing into these bonds, he, uh, for them to make an informed decision, the uh, the uh, the information has to be uh, clearly available. Second is, I think one of the factors that uh, also uh, discussed is the, the the accounting practices uh, that are followed by municipal corporation maybe may not are, are not in line with the what the investors look at. 
you typically uh, have, uh, have a say, case where the municipalities follow a cash based accounting, which is possibly uh, not the best way of accounting finances. So some of these challenges uh, have to be uh, addressed. Uh, and of course, uh, financial strength or the rating of these instruments becomes a key component. <clears throat> if you look at the rating of these bonds, I think the highest is about double A and there and there about. Uh, when you look at some of the investors, especially the pension funds or insurance companies, their preference would tend to be more on triple A and double A plus. So that again is a uh, is a factor when it comes to investing into uh, debt or bonds. Uh, so some of these factors will have to be looked at when it comes to uh, sort of looking at. So these these factors will play out as far as the growth of monies are concerned. Got it. So just to summarize uh, what I understand from uh, you know. From... From what you mentioned, uh, one is greater amount of transparency, greater amount of information dissemination amongst investors, and you know a better accounting practices possibly, which gives more fairness to the overall financials of debts. Right, that would become very important uh, in developing the the money bonds in our country. And also, one more factor is the funds which are raised; they also need to be deployed in an efficient manner. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there is the uh, 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 sufficient uh, revenue which gets generated, which can be used for servicing these bonds. Right. So efficient utilization of fund also becomes critical uh, from the investor's perspective. Yeah, and and once they start doing it, um, you know, even if they're able to showcase it, rating agencies like yours, right, would be able to give them a better rating, and then it means they will become, you know, suitable candidates for investment by these pension funds, right? So definitely, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done on that ground. But yeah, um, it's it's a market that that we hope that grows up and you know is able to fund. The municipalities across the country for the entire country's growth. Now, double clicking on this green bond side, right? You mentioned that you know pension funds and other alternate investment funds uh, have got provisions uh, to take some exposure into them, right? And the first tranche we saw was last year, right? The question over here is: uh, in this uh, new segment, is there a way for retail to also participate, or does it have to be through a fund route? Like, I mean, can I invest in a green bond, uh, uh, you know, a bond only, right, as asset class, uh, like I would do in, let's say, a corporate bond of a particular company or a bank, right? Do I have that provision for green bonds also? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the bonds which were issued uh, last year, I think to a large extent, so most of these bonds were subscribed by the global investors. Uh, so basically, it's the foreign money coming into Understood. India through these bonds. So I think, uh, not sure, uh, I won't be able to comment on whether the retail investors can participate at this stage. But I, and if you look at it, largely it is uh, a segment which is uh, being preferred by foreign institutional investors where there is a mandate uh, a part of their mandate allows them to invest into such papers. Uh, if you look at India, you have, uh, uh, so green bond is one aspect, you have new ESG mutual funds also, but largely those are equity oriented funds. You don't have any debt uh, fund which focuses on themes like ESG or for that matter climate or the green bond that we uh, talk about. So at this stage, even the indirect route is not available uh, for the investors to participate uh, in these bonds. Got it. Got it. Uh, now coming to the topic of the sovereign gold bonds, right? Um, there is an increasing appetite that we see of participation by retail over here also. And I think there's a tranche in February, which is being, you know, which will be opened up by RBI. Um, and uh, uh, retail investors can buy as low as one unit of gold over there. They get 2.5% that extra income that you mentioned, right, which is paid a half yearly. And then there's capital appreciation, capital gains, tax exemption, all great story for retail, right? Uh, but then if I extrapolate this to the overall corporate bond market also, right, we know there are some very 
great moves which has been done by sebi lately in bringing down the privately placed bonds tays value from 10 lakh which was while to now at 1 lakh and then there are you know white papers on discussions of bringing it down even further right uh, and also mechanisms that online platforms offering yeah. these bonds need to be registered as a debt broker and yes. need to be a member of the exchange any one or both of the exchanges as an obpp member or an online bond platform provider uh now are there other things beyond this also that the government can do to increase the retail participation into this bond market what would be your views you know as, as a specialist in this field yeah so in fact uh, some of the initiatives that the government has taken including regulator has definitely meant increase participation uh, in the bonds in the last 2 to 2 to 3 years in fact uh, um, if i look at some of the numbers uh, the the rbi direct platform has seen an increased number of participation by 62% in the last one year even for even in case of uh, uh, online bond platform like yours and many others there is a uh, increased participation that we have seen uh, 100% increase in the last three years which yeah. has meant that that uh, this is an area that uh, investors are finding it uh, useful from the perspective of portfolio uh, building uh, i think you spoke about decrease in the uh, uh, the ticket size to 1 lakh rupee uh, but when you compare this number to a uh, uh, other investment options the ticket sizes are far lesser right including right. small saving uh, schemes or fixed deposit or even right. for that matter mutual funds Absolutely. the ticket size for a retail investor is far lower compared to the 1 lakh rupee that we have here right so that is a big factor and that can further enhance participation having said that investor experience is critical uh, when they invest into these bonds uh, uh, and this is what we have seen even in case of mutual funds when investors have experience uh, fairly good performance as far as the equity funds are concerned there seems to be a continuous flow of money that has been coming into a mutual fund similar will be true for even participation of retail investor into uh, direct bonds through the online platform of course ease of transaction becomes very critical uh, how easily the investor can start investing into these bonds uh, also becomes a big factor if there are operational challenges then investors who are willing to evaluate these options would uh, sort of you you you'll lose those investor uh, possibly for a period of time right. so these are some of the areas i think uh, would be critical for increased participation so just to summarize um, what you mentioned is one a uh, further lowering of the ticket size to really really re retail sachet uh, which is not there as yet but which is there prevalent in the other investment assets number one number two is you know um, quality of the inventory that is coming out into the market and number three uh, the investment experience of the retail investors it needs to be very seamless so that you know they have that ease of transaction and they can you know um, stick on to you know this particular asset class with great investment experience and post that also great point now um uh, you know uh, a special category of these bonds the in the corporate bond area is the capital gains uh, taxation saving bonds of the 54 ec category right uh, now it is capped at 50 lakh for an investor right in a fiscal and uh, the government hasn't changed that right uh, what do you think uh, will be the impact of this one you know on investors um, on this particular area of you know of trying to save the taxes post their selling of these uh, of these assets yeah so again uh, uh, it's a uh, 54 ec bonds are a good avenue uh, uh, whenever an investor is uh, sort of uh, uh, ex uh, exiting uh, immovable property and booking uh, or ex or uh, redeeming those investments uh, if they want to kind of look at saving capital gains from those investment 54 ec is a good avenue having mm -hmm. said that there is a cap of 50 lakh rupees so to that extent there is a cap that is in place 
for investors to take benefit as far as the capital gains are concerned. And if you look at the immobile property, the prices can be much higher compared to the 50 lakh, which is currently there. So uh, the increase in uh, the cap will definitely improve the appetite. These are the bonds which are typically issued by AAA rated issuers like NHAI, REC, PFC. So which are from a uh, from the perspective of safety, uh, these are highest rated bonds. Yeah. So with, which is a good avenue for someone to transfer funds once he has booked uh, returns from the uh, the the immovable property uh, that we have. So uh, these are good investment options, but uh, of course that the cap sort of uh, keeps the limited participation. And of course the supply or issuance of such bonds by these entities is also another factor from the perspective of investor participating into these bonds. Got it. And also uh, the investment over here, I think is largely paper driven. It's still not yet digitized mostly not yet digitized so that's also a challenge maybe you know that's an area of improvement that can work out uh, now um you know i'm tempted at this juncture to ask a, a bit of a controversial question right so uh, i know you know Crystal, I, I, you know, you specialize in providing investment research to the capital market right including mutual funds and uh, the topic that I am tempted to ask is last year, um, the government has uh, removed the indexation benefit on debt mutual funds, right? So now for an investor, the corporate bond taxation and the debt mutual fund taxation are exactly the same, right? There is no benefit here or there. And corporate bonds in general yield more than debt mutual funds, if I may say, right? Now, given this scenario, do you still think that debt mutual funds are an attractive destination or will be an attractive destination for retail investors to invest into? Yeah, so uh, I think these two options are still available to the investor and investors, uh, I think one of the key differentiation between mutual fund, debt mutual funds and direct bond was the indexation or the tax benefit which yeah. was available earlier. Uh, which has been done away with. So to that extent, the both products now come on par. And from investor perspective, now for them to make a decision, it is looking at the risk adjusted return from both the investment options that are available to them and make a choice. Uh, having said that, couple of points possibly uh, when you look at mutual fund investments, debt investments, uh, the liquidity is one factor which is still available with a debt mutual fund, which possibly with a direct investment at times could be a challenge. Uh, and it also uh, the, the typical benefits of mutual fund investing in terms of professional management and diversification continue to remain in addition to liquidity. So these three factors are still there. Having said that, uh, with the tax rationalization that happened last year, uh, the to prove products have to be compared strictly on the basis of performance and the one which provides better performance the investors can always choose got it got it so yeah i mean for our investors right i mean um, whenever you make an investment take a judgment call on all parameters right that would be there across both these asset classes now moving on to the next question over here uh, reits and invits have been instruments of the capital market for some time now and uh, they haven't really seen much of a growth but then the question is in this fiscal year uh, you know are you seeing further growth on this area or certain changes you know that would come into these specific investment vehicles yeah so reach and invest these are new instrument types these are fairly popular globally uh, but we haven't seen the growth uh, in India as much as uh, one would expect. Uh, again, these are hybrid instruments. Uh, mm -hmm. These uh, uh, They have a bit of equity component given that uh, the and to that extent the volatility that is associated with these instruments. Uh, 
just pause you for a minute, you know, for a benefit of a lot of our viewers who might have not yet got the exposure into REITs and INVITs, right? If you could explain simplistically what a REIT means and what an INVIT means, you know, I think that would be beneficial. And then, you know, you can share your perspective on how this market is poised for growth and what the government can do around it. Yeah. So uh, REITs and INVITs, again, uh, so these are trust structures. Uh, so similar to a mutual fund, where there is an underlying portfolio. Uh, REITs and INVITs are again uh, structures where there is an underlying portfolio. The only difference is in case of REITs, the underlying portfolio comprises of real estate assets. And in case of INVITs, it is essentially the infrastructure assets. Again, infrastructure assets can vary from road assets to transmission lines to uh, various infrastructure, uh, energy assets, and so on and so forth. Uh, these uh, you have a team, uh, so the, the, the money is collected from the investor. There is a fund management team which manages that money, deploys that money into different assets, which are basically a carve out from or the the uh, from the existing asset. They are pulled together and where the money is deployed and which are used to kind of purchase these assets. Now, uh, if I were to look at Invit as an uh, as an option. Uh, it's a instrument where once the uh, uh, the the invest the money is deployed, the income that is generated from the underlying assets, ninety percent of that income has to be distributed to the investors on an annual basis. So, so that that's one requirement as far as the SEBI is concerned, which means that these are regular income generating instruments. Uh, so, any investor who is looking for regular income, these are the instruments that one can look at. Which is and what is the minimum ticket size for these usually? Uh, uh, so this is this is again an instrument where the ticket size has been brought down significantly. Uh, in the last, I think in the last couple of years, SEBI did make change in the ticket size, which meant that the retail investors can now participate uh, in these instruments. Earlier, the ticket size was large, which meant that. The uh, the there was a bit of entry barrier for retail investors to participate mm -hmm. in this. This has come down significantly uh, in the last one year or so. Uh, also, uh, uh, the while there is a regular income that I was talking about from these instrument, mm -hmm. the the prices of these underlying uh, uh, of these uh, invests or REITs can vary depending on the performance of underlying assets. So, which means that there is that bit of market volatility associated with this instrument. Even if you look at the performance of various invits, which are listed on exchanges, you do find varying performances. So there are some invits who are who have delivered positive return, double digit return come since the uh, the the uh, the listing on the stock exchange, but there are some where the returns are negative also. Having said that, so anyone who's looking for a regular income, uh, one can look at this and also investors need to keep in mind these are not debt instruments. These are hybrid uh, with a equity component in it. Uh, uh, essentially, it is a high dividend yielding paying uh, equity uh, that is uh, there with these instruments. And do they come with a tenure uh, or is it like uh, one has to exit like in a mutual fund? No, so these are not uh, tenured. So the to that extent, this is an equity instrument. Uh, it's something which is listed on exchange. The underlying assets, uh, the value of those assets reflect the prices of uh, 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 these uh, instruments on the exchange. And uh, there is no maturity to these instruments. Got it. Got it. Now, um, you know, uh, and uh, you mentioned that, you know, the, the gradually growing, you know, sectors of financial assets are not yet very large in the country. And I think we have got uh, four REITs in the country, embassy yeah. REIT and uh, uh, being one of them and, and yes. a few others, I think total four that are there, right? So pretty small space. The question is, what do you think can the government do, you know, positive steps over here to increase this particular, you know, the financial assets market size. So I think, uh, uh, like we discussed, the the ticket size has already been decreased for these assets. So to that extent, That's the barrier is yeah. uh, been removed. Uh, 
I think uh, 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 it's more about creating awareness about these instruments. What uh, purpose do they serve is something that the investors need to understand. And uh, see, it's also about ability of an investor to evaluate these instruments. Uh, mm. uh, whether they can make a choice between whether this is good or this is not so great in terms of performance. Mm. So those are some of the areas I think that investors will look at when they make a decision. Of course, the investor experience in terms of performance also, like we discussed earlier, is a relevant factor. So I think uh, I think these are fairly regulated instrument. Uh, SEBI has brought in a lot of regulations around this. Uh, they have requirement of limiting the leverage of these uh, instruments uh, in the uh, so to that extent the the overall uh, leverage in these in uh, in these instruments are less. So I think the instruments are good, but the performance is something that remains to be seen. The the underlying assets, the performance can vary. For example, rose assets, there are different life kind of risk associated with rose assets, uh, which are part of uh, uh, the invits. Uh, so they uh, they that will have a uh, kind of a uh, that has an impact on the overall performance of these instruments and uh, investors need to understand and then they, they can take a call on investing into these instruments. And, and just a very naive question, you know, like uh, do these REITs and invits underlying need to be, you know, commercial estates which generate capital? Otherwise, like, I mean, how would you distribute the dividend, right? I mean, very naive question if you could so revenue generating instrument so uh, i think the 80 percent of any when you look at uh, uh invits i think about 80 percent of the assets need to be uh operational uh which is the reason why uh, uh so that's again one of the factor that uh regulator has mandated as far as the invits are concerned so there are a number of uh requirements that are put in place for reach and invits uh from the investor perspective which are positive. Got it. Got it. Um, so, uh, you know, we got some good understanding about the REITs and invets. Uh, for our viewers, these are definitely uh, high yielding, uh, hybrid asset class, more on the equity side, very little on the debt side, right? Uh, it would be dividend paying assets, right? And um, one needs to evaluate them, the underlying assets that they encompass and make a judgmental call. Uh, they were uh, you know, uh, meant specifically for large ticket investors before, but government has made some proactive changes uh, by virtue of which now retail investors can also look to participate in these issuances with some lump sum amount of money, right? So it's a great way to generate cash flows as well, right? However, it depends upon the performance of the underlying assets as, as, as Piyush mentioned, right? Now, uh, one interesting thing, you know, and I think um, uh, that would be of interest to everybody over here is that uh, there was an expectation the government could increase the standard deduction from both the tax regimes that we have, right? Uh, but there wasn't any change in that, right? Um, now, how would that impact, you know, the investor sentiment in the country? Yeah, so I think uh, uh, tax labs or changes in tax labs or bringing in uh, expectation of having more tax incentives is always a uh, expectation that you have uh, every year uh, before the budget. Yeah, right. Uh, so, but if you look at uh, that's one of the, and at times a lot of time investors kind of uh, pivot around tax benefits when it comes to taking, making the investment decision. But possibly that's not the right way. If you ask me, uh, I think the the investment decisions are to be taken independent. Of course, tax is one factor, but there are a lot of other factors that play out uh, when it comes to making an investment decision. Uh, tax benefits do bring in that positive impact with respect to investors coming in and deploying more money. They tend to kind of utilize whatever limits are available, be it ATC or uh, ATCCD, different uh, 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 you know, provisions are there. Uh, uh, but if you look at, I'll give an example of again, say mutual fund, right? So you have ELSS as a category. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the overall equity assets, uh, it's still a fairly large number. 
uh, compared to ELSS. Of course, the, the, the cap uh, in terms of benefit also limits the participation in uh, ELSS as a category. Having said that, even though the, the, the benefits like ATC is not available across equity mutual fund categories, there has been a fairly good participation that we have seen over the years. So as long as the performance is there, you are able to generate the returns which are expected as per your expectation. Uh, tax would be one of the factors that will bring in that additional kicker. But from the perspective of financial planning or personal finance planning, uh, I think the uh, the investment horizon, what is the sort of goals that you have play a critical role when it comes to building a portfolio. Right, right. One, one last question, you know, before we conclude our discussion and move on to taking um, uh, the, the questions that have been posted by our viewers, right? So um, if I have to uh, ask you to define today's interim budget in one sentence, right? What would be your expression for it? Right. So I see, as I said, this was an interim budget. So uh, uh, I think a lot of announcements that will come in will eventually come in the 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 full uh, uh full year budget that will come in after the general election i, I think one of the key factor that we discussed earlier was the fiscal consolidation uh, and that is very positive from the perspective of uh the overall economy health and also from the debt investors who are already invested into uh, uh debt invest instruments where with the e easing of yield, that will have a positive impact on the uh, returns uh, from a capital appreciation perspective. So, yeah, that's about it. So, it's end of the day, it was an interim budget. So, uh, we need, we should look at the final budget that comes after the general election. Got it. Got it. And you, uh, you know, I follow a, a standard, uh, you know, uh, sort of practice uh, in these discussions that whenever any term is used uh, for the sake of our viewers, right, I request, uh, you know, um, the guest to actually explain, use the term fiscal consolidation, if you could lay out what that means for our viewers. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, government has laid down a plan whereby the fiscal deficit, they have a uh, 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 a target to reduce it to a certain level. Uh, that's what uh, finance minister mentioned during the budget. Uh, so that's a plan that they intend to follow over the next two years. Uh, bringing down the fiscal deficit to an acceptable level is what uh, the fiscal consolidation is all about. Got it. Got it. Um, now, with that, uh... I would move on to you know the questions uh, that have been posted uh, from our uh, you know from our viewers. So let's take the first question over here. The first question is uh, uh, this is uh, from an anonymous attendee. Name is not there, but I'll put forth the question. It's an interesting one. The total size of the 2024-25 budget stands at rupees. 47.66 lakh crore, 6.1% bigger than the revised estimate for 2023-24. To help meet the gap between its income and expenditure of rupees 16.8 lakh crore or the fiscal deficit pegged at lower than expected 5.1% of the GDP, the center will borrow 14.13 lakh crores from the market by issuing bonds. Okay. How do you see this impacting the bond yields or the GSEC yields? I think Piyush has covered it, uh, you know, nonetheless, nonetheless, you know, maybe Piyush, you can re-emphasize on this question. Yeah, so I think uh, 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 what we have seen is a fiscal deficit is something which is uh, pegged lower compared to the current financial year. Uh, we do expect lower inflation uh, in the next year along with the uh, declining uh, crude oil prices. So all of these factors will kind of contribute towards easing of yields as we move in the next fiscal year. On top of it, inclusion of uh, uh, Indian government securities in the uh, the global indices will further add to the easing of interest rates. So uh, at least what we uh, uh, believe is by the end of this year, the 10-year GSEC will be about 7%. 
uh, and in the next one year it should come down to 6.8 percent uh, that's the expectation that we have as of today uh, of course the markets are dynamic so you will have a lot of other factors playing out but uh, with the uh, with the current budget today's budget that we saw at least the immediate impact is the downward pressure on the yields uh, that we have seen even today the 10 year GSEC is eased by seven basis point. So mm -hmm. that's the impact that we have observed. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, from Satyavir Singh. Uh, this is a question which has been answered uh, you know, during the discussion. Nonetheless, I'll bring it up for the benefit of all. Was there a change in the taxation as it was anticipated for this budget? No. Also, how do you see the growth of the nation as a whole with this budget? A generic question, but you know, if you, you may kindly share your views. Yeah, but I think uh, there's a lot of initiatives uh, uh, which anywhere beyond the budget the government is taking from the perspective of GDP growth. And we have seen uh, uh, higher than expected GDP growth even for the current fiscal year. So that's something that uh, we hope uh, will continue as we move into the next year. Uh, there are, uh, see, uh, one is the announcement, set of announcements that have that are made in the budget. But beyond the budget, there are also a lot of initiatives that are taken by the government. Uh, and I, of course, we have to see the full fiscal year budget when it comes around after the general election. That will also show a clear picture in terms of how the entire year will look like from uh, the perspective of economic. Got it. Our next question is on the infrastructure development. And the question is, in this interim budget outlay for infrastructure development was lot in focus. See, 11.11 lakh crores for FY25. Can we see an increase in bond issuances uh, in this segment? Interesting question. Yeah, so uh, we can see, I think we'll have to see uh, how it plays out. Uh, 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 see, uh, infrastructure spending, the borrowing can happen either through bond or there are alternate means to raise money. So it's how the, the, the funds will be raised and eventually that will determine the total borrowing that will come in. Uh, the, again, one of the factor would be also the re reduced interest rate. So that will have a positive impact on the increased borrowing uh, through the bond market. Mm -hmm. So we can expect an increase in that. So overall, it would be a positive type for the bond market yeah. that we can we can think of. Cool. I think that's all. Uh, you know, uh, to our panelists, um, to our viewers. Um, you know, if you have got further questions feel free to write to us, you know, and, uh, you know, we'll share with, with Piyush and the Crescent team so that, you know, they can, you know, share their answers and perspectives and we'll get back to you with that. Right. So Piyush, thank you so much uh, for your time and sharing those deep insights, right. You are an industry veteran, right. Fully armed with the knowledge about this capital market, right. And the views that you have shared will be invaluable to our investors and our viewers and like, uh, Thanks a lot for, you know, for sharing that with us. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure talking to you. Likewise, Piyush. Thank you, everybody. A big round of thanks for all our viewers today. Hope you, you know, learned from this webinar and about the interim budget. And we'll wait to see how the final general budget uh, shapes up. Thank you. Thank you.